Welcome early American Literature friends. This is a short video that's going to hopefully guide you through two of Edgar Allan Poe's most famous poems, The Raven and Annabel Lee. Uh, we are going to talk briefly about Poe. Uh, he was, he is, Poe is important in American literature first and foremost because he is the father of like all horror and gothic for American literature. He is the, he brings, um, all of what we think of as like horror and suspense and mystery and all of that kind of stuff, he is in many ways the father of it in this country. Um, he is technically a romantic writer. He belongs to the romantic movement, which in this country begins right around 1800 or 1810 and then goes up to the Civil War sometime in the 1860s. But um, horror and gothic, and really the goth gothic is a sort of subgenre of the romantic movement and Poe is this sort of king of the American Gothic and the father of the American Gothic and all of this sort of horror and suspense and mystery that comes that comes in the generations after Poe is really descended from Poe um, and the Romantic movement. You see Poe is born in 1809 and he dies in 1849. Um, he dies from uh, some combination of alcoholism and tuberculosis. Uh, the Raven is by far and away his most famous poem. It is published in 1845, a few years before his death. Um, he wrote it in Baltimore. In fact, the Baltimore Ravens, the football team, is named for the Raven, the poem. We're going to deal with it first and then jump to Annabelle Lee. Annabelle Lee was published two days after Poe's death in 1849. The circumstances of Poe's death are sort of mysterious. Um, he, he is found outside of a polling place, a, a voting area. Um, it, it is clear that he is like both profoundly unhealthy, but also on some kind of like, like alcoholic binge and deeply intoxicated. Um, he is like semi-conscious, if not outright in a coma and then dies a, a day or two after. And so he has this sort of tragic life, um, and the tragic end to his life with the tragic death. Um, but the 1840s are this really rich period for him, and it is in 1845 that he writes The Raven, the, like I said, the poem that perhaps the single piece of work that he is most famous for. And then Annabelle Lee, uh, a few years later in 1840, is published in 1849. Um, one reason, let me pull up The Raven here. One reason that The Raven is so famous is because he very successfully this is a poem about the presence of absence. He is, the speaker in the poem is missing this person, missing this woman named Lenore who has died. Um, and her absence is like a physical presence for him. And so you have this sort of juxtaposition or irony of something is missing, but that missingness becomes physically there, becomes physically present. And then it is embodied in the Raven which like comes into his room and then um, sits above the door and at the end of the poem is still there. And so you get it. It's almost like he, the raven is this infestation of sadness or gloominess or loneliness. And he gives you a bunch of different language for that in the poem. Um, because the poem even starts with that. a midnight. So it's midnight. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary. So you get dreary, weak and weary right there in the first line. And it sort of sets the tone. This is one of the things Poe is famous for, what he calls single effect. In almost all of his poems and stories, he is trying to create and achieve some single effect. And you can get from this poem, um, the single effect he is going for in this poem is this sort of dreariness and sorrow and sadness. Um, that first stanza of the poem sets you up. Uh, it both sets that tone of like darkness and dreariness and sadness. Um, and then it gives you, it gets the action rolling in the poem too, because he hears a knocking, which the speaker in the poem first thinks is somebody knocking on his door, but it is not somebody knocking on his door, um, which he quickly discovers. He opens the door. Um, he thinks he hears son knocking, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. But then he opens the door. Um, he opens the door and there is nothing there. Uh, he also says in the second stanza, it's bleak December again, more like sadness, bleak mysteriousness. It's December. Um, he and then let me get my book open here. Um, he he also gives you in that second stanza um, from my book surcease of sorrow. He's trying to get a break from all of his sorrow. He gives you Lenore. Um, 
it's dead and that she is gone nameless here forevermore because she is gone she's gone beyond where she, this world and um have a name uh he and then in the fourth stanza presently my soul grew stronger uh sir truly for your forgiveness i i implore with the fact as i was napping um that i scarce was sure i heard you here i open wide the door darkness there and nothing more that is where the poem sets up the the presence of absence he opens the door there's an absence there's nothing there and it sets you up deep into that darkness peering a lot of this poem is devoted to that idea that idea of peering into the darkness and they're seeing the, the nothingness of darkness but also it has this effect on you um this this sort of like looking into the darkness too long and the effect it can have on you um and then the poem shifts because this i whispered and an echo murmured back the word lenore so he speaks her name first in the poem he's he speaks into the darkness and then he turns back into the room and then and he turns back into the room he hears the tapping again so by this point soon again i heard a tapping somewhat louder than before surely said i surely that is something in my window lattice and so he realizes it's not something knocking at the door something knocking at the window um he goes to the window open here i flung the shutter when with many a flirt and flutter in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore so he opens the window the raven comes in um, the raven comes in out of the darkness obviously it's midnight it's dark so the raven comes in it's a black bird it's very clear this sort of physical embodiment of the darkness um the, the raven comes in uh and it, and it immediately flies to perched above my chamber door perched upon a busted palace just above my chamber door and so it like sits as this sort of like um guardian or observer over the door and then then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling and so he tries to think to make it a joke at first he's like oh this, this is something i can laugh at but by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore though thy crest be shorn and shaven art thou no craven um ghastly grim and ancient raven and so you're getting this like again ghastly grim and ancient raven you're getting all this dark imagery this sad imagery and the raven for the first time speaks but it gives you the only word it's ever going to say quote the raven nevermore tell me what that lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore quote the raven nevermore so the raven says nevermore and at first he takes it for the raven's name um but the raven sitting lonely on the class um where, where are we at there but the raven sitting lonely on the placid bus spoke only that one word as if his soul in that one word he did outpour nothing farther he uttered not a feather then he he fluttered um and and so at first what you get is the speaker trying to figure out why is the raven saying nevermore it just repeats nevermore there are three stanzas right here in the middle um it, that give you never quote the raven nevermore with such a name as nevermore quote the raven nevermore that same answer nevermore man croaking croaking nevermore um but the but what you get down here but the raven still beguiling all my fancy into smiling straight i will the cushion seat in front of bird and busting door and so he sits down and tries to talk to the bird is trying to have this interaction um but the bird uh what this grim ungainly ghastly gaunt and ominous bird of yore meant and croaking nevermore there's the language that he's giving you right there grim ungainly ghastly gaunt ominous it's all this dark language the bird is a dark omen he's trying to talk himself out of it he's trying to like get some meaning out of this bird and trying to find some hopeful meaning and then the poem takes us takes a turn um right here then methought the air grew denser perfume from an unseen censer swung by a seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor wretch i cried thy god hath lent, lent thee by these angels he hath sent thee respite respite and nepenthe from my memories of lenore quaff oh quaff this kind of this kind of nepenthe and forget this loss in lenore quote the raven nevermore there's the first dark turn he asked the raven if he's ever going to forget lenore if he's ever going to get over the sadness the raven says no you're never going to get over it that's the first dark turn that you get um, he lets the raven in it, up to this point he's been sort of staring into the darkness but we haven't been in this total like loss of hope and sadness and sorrow and the poem right here um, the the speaker and the, the interaction that the speaker has with the raven takes this dark turn and the whole rest of the poem is this darker 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 these sort of explanations from the raven um, 
Because once the Raven says, no, you'll never get over Lenore, you'll never forget this sadness, you're, you're never going to forget this lost Lenore, the speaker says, prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet, if bird or devil, whether tempter sin or tempest toss, the, temp the tempter there is the devil trying to like get him, get the speaker to press lead into darkness. Um, then he says, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quote the raven nevermore. It, that's a biblical reference. And balm in Gilead is this sort of like, is there some kind of solace? Will I get some kind of relief from this sadness, like from religion or in the next life or something like that? Will I ever get over this in this life or the next? And the raven says, nope, you're never going to get that either. And you get again, prophet, said I, thing of evil, by that heaven that bends above us. Um, tell this so with Sarlav and if within the distant Aden. This is a reference to the Garden of Eden, to Eden, to paradise, to heaven, to the afterlife. Um, it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. And so he says, look, you're telling me, he asked the bird, you're telling me that I'll never get over missing Lenore. I'll never get over this sadness. I'm never going to have her again in this life. But what about in the next life? What about in the afterlife? Will I see her again? Will I get to hold? Will I get to clasp her and hold her again? No. And the bird says, nope, you're not getting that either. You're never going to get any kind of relief. The speaker says, be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend. And he's like, I'm done talking to you. You're just making things worse. You're making me feel worse. You're telling me all these awful things. Get thee back into the tempest. Leave no black plume. Leave no black plume. No feathers here. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the, quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart. Take thy form from off my door. Quote the raven nevermore. This is where the, it's clear that the bird is this sort of embodiment of his sadness and sorrow and suffering, how he's never going to get over Lenore because the raven is never going to leave because it is the embodiment of her absence and, and him missing her, and he's never going to, and that's never going to leave. And the raven never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. Um, and the lamp light over him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. So the speaker is like living in a shadow because he's down under the bird. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. And so you, the poem ends in this really dark place where he has accepted that the speaker has accepted the raven's never going to leave. The sadness is never going to leave. He's never going to get over this. There's, there's no end to this like sorrow. There's no end to the absence of Lenore and the speaker feeling that absence and feeling that sorrow and suffering. So this is really this is re this really dark poem about being about the presence of absence and constantly feeling that presence and this sense that you're never gonna get over that absence that it's always gonna be with you. You're always gonna be feeling it. Um, Annabelle Lee gives you a very similar effect um, because it is about. It is about, uh, same thing, you get a speaker who has lost his love. Um, and the Raven, it's Lenore, here it's Annabelle Lee. Um, but there is some explanation in Annabelle Lee, and it is a supernatural explanation. Um, and there is this sort of like mystical fairy tale effect in Annabelle Lee too. Many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea, so it's like kingdom by the sea, this sort of fairy tale language, um, that a maiden there lived, whom you may know by the name of Annabelle Lee, and this maiden, she lived no other thought than to love and be loved by me. And that is really um, one of the central things that you that makes this slightly different. You get the absence of the beloved in both the Raven and Annabelle Lee. But this poem, there's a bunch of this sort of love, um, and the love persists. That is the central difference in this poem and the Raven is the love binds them. The Raven says, no, you're never going to get her again. But in Annabelle Lee, their love like crosses the boundary of the life and afterlife, and it still binds them together even after she's gone. Um, I was a child and she was a child, but we loved with a love that was more than love. I am my Annabelle Lee. Um, with the love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And so you get this, uh, the angels, they love so deeply and so passionately and so purely um, is, is really the key here that even the angels, the seraphs, the seraphim are jealous of their love. And this was the reason that long ago, a wind blew out of a cloud, chilling my beautiful Annabelle Lee, um, so that her highborn kinsman came, bore her away from me, shut her in a sepulcher in this kingdom by the sea. And so some like 
dark wind, some dark curse from the angels comes down, kills Annabelle Lee. The angels not half, not half so happy in heaven when envying her and me. So they were like jealous of the purity and strength of their love. That the wind came out of the cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabelle Lee. So they killed Annabelle Lee to try to stop this love between them. But our love was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we. And neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever. That's, that's a central idea in this poem is this idea of dissevering, which is like separating um, or like disconnecting them. And nothing can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. That is what you get in this poem that distinguishes it from Lenore and the Raven, because um, the Raven, at, at the end of that poem, the, the darkest, the big punishment here is that they are disconnected and they will never be connected again. The speaker here says, Annabelle Lee has died, but we're still connected. We're not, we're, and we, nothing could ever disconnect us. And that's what you get um, in the last stanza of this poem, the last section of this poem, is that he goes down to her tomb and sleeps every night because they are still connected. My darling, my darling, my life and my bride in her sepulcher there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea, and all the night tide I lie down by her side. And so that's the key difference. In the, the Raven is this really dark poem where the, it's totally hopeless. There's no hope in the, of ever seeing her again in this life or in the afterlife. Um, but despite the fact that Annabelle Lee has died, there is still hope here and there is still connection. The, the connection hasn't been severed between them in spite of the best effort of the supernatural best efforts of the angels. Hopefully that gives you some understanding of Poe's, really Poe's two famous poems. They're both love poems. Um, Poe had a sort of tumultuous love life. He ended up marrying his, his, I think it's his third cousin, but she was also much younger than him. She was a minor. So there is this sort of scandalous, um, sh he had the, con not, not to say that this was okay, um, but he had the consent of that woman's, that girl's mom. Um, but it's still obviously deeply problematic. And then one of the sort of fascinations with Poe, um, Poe the writer, not the poems that, or the stories themselves, but one of the ongoing fascinations with Poe is this sort of like deeply troubled life that he lived with marrying this much younger cousin and having all these problems with alcohol and, and drugs and all these things. Um, these poems, uh, one of the things that these poems give you is this sort of sense of like being deeply troubled, like feeling intense pain and suffering, but also that the balm, like to use Poe's word, the balm for all that suffering, the balm in Gilead is to not be severed from the people that you love um, and to still feel connected with them. And so in Annabelle Lee, the speaker gets the kind of balm that the speaker and the raven can't get and the raven tells him he's never gonna get. So I hope that helps you understand these two poems, um, especially, including the supernatural parts of them, like the raven has in the raven has um, this is this sort of supernatural power bird um, embodiment of absence, and then there's obviously the angels and them sending down this wind to get Annabelle Lee in Annabelle Lee, um, and so hopefully that helps you understand some of the gothic and, and grotesque aspects of. Uh, these two poems pose two fam most famous poems. Hope y'all are doing well. If I can answer any questions about Poe or either of these poems, please just be in touch.